I'm going to talk a little bit about institutions which have become weak, which have become compromised, which have ceased to be autonomous and independent. I'll talk a little bit of the current political situation, the personalization of politics in this country. And I'll look at after the outcome of the assembly elections at in Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, Telangana, Rajasthan were known. What is likely to happen over the next four or five months in the run-up to the next Lok Sabha elections, which are probably going to take place sometime from the late from late March till early May. I'll talk a little bit about crony capitalism and oligarchy in India at present. I'd look at the state of the media because the media is an important pillar of democracy. It's often called the fourth estate of democracy. Uh, the media is what it is today because of a variety of reasons. And I'm going to explain to the best of my ability why the media is the way it is today. And all of you who live in Kerala should keep in mind the the rest of India is very different from Kerala. I mean, here when the Lok Sabha elections happen, it doesn't really matter how much the LDF led by the Communist Party of India Marxist or the UDF led by the Indian National Congress win because both of them will come together in Delhi. But in other parts of India, the political situation is very, very different. While I talk to you about the state of the media in India, I'm also going to tell you a little bit about what happened in the case of NewsClick. The action against NewsClick or the private entity, the private limited company that owns and runs NewsClick, has been investigated by the Enforcement Directorate, by the Income Tax Department, and more importantly, by the special cell of the Delhi Police by the Economic Offences Wing of the Delhi Police, and of course, by the Central Bureau of Investigation. So it's several agencies that have come together. And I'll conclude my presentation on looking ahead, which is very difficult. It's not easy to envision tomorrow. We would all like to believe what we would want to, what tomorrow should be. Whether it will be that way is a separate matter. We, we've seen across the world the rise of the right wing. Some parts of the world, the right wing has become weak. Other parts, they remain very strong. I'll come to Mr. Narendra Modi later, but demagogue, a demagogue is a leader who seeks and obtains political support on the basis of emotional appeals, not necessarily on the basis of facts and factual analysis. That is something that brings together several individuals. And that includes, of course, besides India's Honorable Prime Minister Narendra Modi, it includes China's Premier, Russia's head, Donald Trump, Bolsonaro, who is no longer there in Brazil. It's Lula who is now heading the government. Trump is, even today, he says, I, I didn't lose the election. We don't know what will happen in the next elections in America. We've seen Erdogan of Turkey, Orban of Hungary. We've seen what happened closer home to the Philippines. Duterte. He's not there anymore. He's been replaced by Marcos' son. So right-wing demagogues rise, right-wing demagogues fall, but the movement that have to be led by progressive forces to have a world which is less unequal, more equitable, it's not going to be easy and not going to end tomorrow. It's going to go on for a long time. As I talk today, India is perhaps, not perhaps, almost certainly, the most unequal country on planet Earth. The gap between the rich and the poor. I don't say in very simplistic terms the poor are getting poorer, the rich are getting richer. But the gap between the poor and the rich have widened. You can say India was always a land of 
inequality from the days of the Rajas and the Maharajas and the Nizams and the Sultans and the Shahin Shahs and the ordinary people. Yes, of course it was. But if we look at India after 1947, today India is the most unequal country in the world. It has overtaken Brazil, Argentina, the United States, Russia, South Africa. I'm, I don't see this. Eminent economists, including Thomas Piketty, and mind you, they are not leftists. They are not at all leftists, some of them. But on the basis of the data that they have analyzed, this is the conclusion that they've come to. It's going to be a tough job competing with the bulldozer Raj. But we see the bulldozers very active all over North India. And yes, of course, the houses of one particular community have been targeted by the bulldozers. And that is the community of the Muslims. Today, one out of seven Indians, one out of seven Indians is Muslim. Roughly 14%, 15% of the population of India. In Kerala, the proportion is higher. I know that. In Bengal, the proportion is higher. There are several other parts of the country where the proportion is higher or lower. But this is the average. What does this mean? Out of 1.4 billion or 140 crore, if one out of seven Indians are Muslim, it's more than 200 million or 20 crore. There are more Muslims in India than in all but two countries in the world, Indonesia and Pakistan. Yet, never before since the 1940s have the Muslim community in India been told in no uncertain terms that they, if they want to live in Hindustan, they have to be second-class citizens. Not explicitly, but implicitly. Look at a law like the CAA, the Citizenship Amendment Act. For the first time, you've enacted a law on religious lines. It's a separate matter. You've not been able to implement that law. At least not as yet. At least you're claiming that. Why is it that those who belong to the majority community, and they comprise more than 80% of our population, why is the rhetoric of the right wing saying Hindu khatre mein hai? That is, Hindus are in danger. Where in the world have you seen this kind of political discourse or message? Please understand that Islamophobia is at its peak in India. In the 40s, when my parents emigrated from what was then East Bengal, what is today Bangladesh, to West Bengal, they saw, my parents saw the great Kolkata killings where human blood flowed on the streets of Kolkata. This was the time of the Second World War. Earlier you had the Great Bengal Famine. In 1945, you also saw ideological opponents coming together in the salubrious resort on the Black Sea called Yalta. Joseph Stalin, Theodore Roosevelt, and Winston Churchill, they all came together because they had a common enemy, and that was the fascist Adolf Hitler. By that time, Hitler's regime was already down, was getting down, and then he committed suicide. Why am I drawing this analogy? The question is, look at India. Look at the Indian political scenario. Narendra Modi's biggest success is that he has been able to personalize politics in India. Man, but I'm two. Me versus you. If you're not with me, you're against me. Then, Banam Pap. He's, of course, stopped calling Ramgandhi Papu after he walked for about 3,500 kilometers from Kanyakumari to Kashmir. Maybe he's going to take another walk from Kutch to Kohima. But look at facts. The Bharti Janta Party on its own in 2014 got 32% of the vote. There were 900 million people eligible to vote above the age of 18, of which roughly 68% voted. Five years later, the Bharti Janta Party's vote share went up by 6% to around 30%, 38%. The NDA, or the National Democratic Alliance, in 2014 had roughly 38% of the vote. In 2019, it had roughly 45% of the vote. What does this mean? In 2019, 55% of those who voted did not vote for either the BJP or the NDA, but their votes were fragmented. The question is whether the India Alliance can stay together. 
It's a big question. I don't know the answer to this question. But the personalization of politics has been one of the facts that we have to accept. And one of the big reasons why Narendra Modi is where he is, whether or not he will get a third term as Prime Minister after May 2024, we'll have to wait and watch. But India's multi-party democracy has been converted into almost like a two-person contest, like the American, like the American system of government. They, they follow a different system of government. But that's the way it is. Joe Biden versus Donald Trump. Trump versus Hillary Clinton. So he has been successful in making India's multi-party democracy into a two-person contest. So we have to acknowledge this fact. Let's look at what has happened to the institutions of this country. Naveen talked about education. I know what's happening when Arif Mohammed Khan, your governor, what he has been doing, you know better than I. But wait, it's not just the educational institutions. Look at the media, look at the military, look at the bureaucracy or the civil service, look at the judiciary, all these institutions, I can say, are today more subservient to those in positions of power and authority, the ruling dispensation, than in a long, long time. Perhaps since the middle of the 70s when Indira Gandhi imposed the emergency, 1975 to 77. We can compare that period with today. You can argue which was worse or which was a lesser evil. The emergency effectively lasted 19 months. At the end of the 21st month, Indira Gandhi was voted out of, but she returned to power in January 1980. That was a time when the right and the left came together to oppose Indira Gandhi. India Alliance, we don't know who is the lesser evil, who is the bigger evil. But look at other institutions. Look at Constitution. Look. The Election Commission of India, the Controller and Auditor General of India, the Central Vigilance Commission. All these bodies have been packed with individuals whose claim to fame is their loyalty to the ruling regime. An election commissioner had to put in his papers in 2019 because it's common knowledge that he opposed complaints that were made against Narendra Modi and, and Union Home Minister Amit Shah for using the military for campaigning. This was just after Pulwama and Balakot. Mr. Ashok Lavasa was had to go to Manila to the Asian Development Bank. Some of us would like to believe he was kicked upstairs. He's back in Delhi, of course, now. So it's not just institutions like the media, the judiciary, the bureaucracy, the military, educational institutions. It is not just the constitutional authorities. It is the law enforcing agencies, the enforcement directorate, the Indian tax department, the Central Bureau of Investigation, the National Investigation Agency, and all these bodies have from time to time been misused by those in power. But never before on this scale, these institutions have become weapons. What distinguishes this regime from earlier regimes is not that they are intolerant. Yes, whoever is in power are intolerant. They are vengeful. So they are not just intolerant. They want to take revenge on those who are opposed to them. You're not with us, you're against us. So, when you look at these bodies, let me give you one example. There are numerous examples, and NewsClick itself offers several uh, instances of how these law enforcing agencies have been used or misused. Let's take an example with which all of you will understand quite easily. The Narcotics Control Board, Board, Bureau, Bureau, Board, I'm not sure, NCB. Can you imagine how it was weaponized? Let me tell you about Shah Rukh Khan, Muslim by birth, very popular, very rich, married a Hindu. 
they have two children. His son is put behind bars for almost a month. Why? A particular officer of the NCP, Samir Wankhede, who is himself now under the scanner, accuses him of violating the narcotics and psychotropic substances. What do they find? They find nothing on him. They don't even find a little puriya or gaja on him. But sometimes, arrogance makes people so drunk with power that they act in a stupid manner. So let me explain how. So when Pathan was released, a lot of the right wing says, Ari, Deepika is insulting the saffron color. In Besharam Rang, she has about 25 changes of costume in five minutes. And one of them happens to be a saffron sarong. The Madhya Pradesh, the then Home Minister of Madhya Pradesh, Narottam Mishra says, very bad, very bad, very bad. What happens? The producers of the film, Yashraj Films, are very happy, very happy. They are laughing all the way to the bank and back. In less than two months, they have made 1,500 crore at the box office. Then what does Shahrukh do? He means Javan. See it if you haven't seen. Fiction. Everything is fiction, right? No person in the film has any resemblance to any person dead or alive. And any resemblance, if any, is purely coincidental. Why do farmers commit suicide? Why are the corporates and the, the, the politicians colluding to destroy our environment? Why does a doctor who tries to help young patients by sourcing oxygen, why does he get discriminated against? How, how, how trustworthy are the electronic voting machines? See, Javan. Just an example of how institutions have become what they are. What is capitalism? What is socialism? We can have another seminar on that. Because these words mean different things to different people at different points of time and keep changing. Who is socialist? Who is communist? Who is capitalist? Who is a crony capitalist? These words keep changing. I mean, I can talk to you for half an hour on the subject, but I won't. I have some personal experience on this, so I'm going to share my personal experiences with you as well. The nexus between business and politics, big business and politics, is neither new nor is it unique to India. It's happening across the world. Before 1947, the Indian National Congress had several business persons who acted as, as its treasurer, including Jamnalal Bajaj, including Kasur Bhai Lal Bhai, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, where, 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 where was he killed? On the 30th of January 1948, where was he killed? He was killed in a home that belonged to Gansham Das Birla. Read what Gandhi had to say, what Gandhiji had to say about why he took the help of Swadeshi nationalists to fight the British. His view is very different. Even Sardar Patel's views are very different from that of Narendra Modi's guru, Golwalkar, who in his famous book, Bunch of Thoughts has written that more than the British, the three biggest internal enemies of the Hindus in India, in Hindustan, are Muslims, Christians and communists. Remember, he's one guru that Narendra Modi acknowledges as his guru. This is, this is the reality of the India that we're living in. Let's move on. The Birlas, the Tatas, the Ambanis, they all gained from the way government policies have been shaped the government policies, the way they've been implemented, how they've helped one group at the expense of another group, how they've put down their competition. But today we have a different stage. We have a different level. We have reached a stage which is called oligarchy, where there's little to distinguish between the government or the state and the business person or the oligarch. The chief minister of Delhi, Arun Kejriwal, on the floor of the House, on the floor of the Delhi Legislative Assembly, he made two statements. Not my statements, remember. It's his statements. You can see it on YouTube. 
he said he he speaks in Hindi. He says in this country of 140 crore people, we deserve a prime minister who's not a fourth class pass. Our country is great. It's 140 crore people. The world's biggest country is Tanzania, but our country's prime minister should not be a fourth class pass. He said another thing on another day. Short speech. This was after the Hindenburg research report came out on Adani's conglomerate, describing it as the world's biggest con in the corporate sector. Again, he said in Hindi, ये तो अडानी जी का पैसा नहीं है ये तो मोदी जी का पैसा है ये कंपनी तो अडानी जी का नहीं है तो मोदी जी का कंपनी है दिस मनी डजेंट बिलोंग टू मिस्टर अडानी इट बिलोंग्स टू मिस्टर मोदी दिस कंपनी डजेंट बिलोंग टू मिस्टर अडानी इट बिलोंग्स टू मिस्टर मोदी ही सेड दिस नाउ इट दे कैन डू एनीथिंग टू हिम व्हाई ही इज प्रोटेक्टेड फ्रॉम प्रोसिक्यूशन ही इज स्पीकिंग इन द लेजिस्लेटिव असेंबली ऑफ दिल्ली दे कैन शो हिम आई एम डिफरेंट If Arvind Kejriwal makes the same statement outside the Vidhan Sabha, he can be sued. Today, I am the only citizen of India against whom Mr. Gautam Adani's lawyers have instituted six cases of defamation, five in Gujarat and one in Rajasthan. A non-bailable warrant of arrest was issued against me in January 2021. As you can see, I'm out of jail. I never went there. Unlike Prabir Purakastha. Who's been in jail from third of October till today, as we talk, and that too under a law which is arguably the most draconian of all laws in India statute books, that is the UAPA, the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. What will happen to him? I don't know. I don't want to anticipate the media. Uh, the, the sorry, anticipate the work of the judiciary, and I would. But what I can do is I can provide you the facts. <clears throat> you Google me, you'll know why these cases are against me. You can read these art. Some of these articles are available online. As we talk of the media in India, before we talk about the media in India, we have to talk about the media in the world a little bit. And all those who are interested in further studies on the subject, please read an American scholar, Shoshana Zuboff, a book on. The era of surveillance capitalism, with an amazing subtitle, with something like this: "The fight for a human future at the new frontier of power." At the new frontiers of power. Today we have a clutch of multinational corporations who never before have exerted the kind of influence they have on what you read, what you watch, and what you. Hear. I'll take only two examples. Take. A conglomerate called Alphabet. Alphabet Incorporate includes in it Google. Google has a range of services. They have a virtual monopoly on the search engines, location maps, news feeds, a whole lot of other services. But Alphabet includes not just Google; it includes YouTube, which too has a virtual monopoly on video, public video available. Or, or public video programming, and that's not all. Alphabet is also the owner of the most popular operating system, which you use on your computers and on your phones. I'm sorry, not on your computers, but on your phones, and that's the Android operating system. Only a very, very small proportion of the operating systems are not Android. They have Apple. So this is the kind of hold one conglomerate has. It meta. It includes Facebook. It includes Instagram, and most importantly, it includes WhatsApp. In India, India is the biggest consumer base or the user base of WhatsApp. If any of you are more interested in the subject, see a documentary film on Netflix called "The Social Dilemma," and you will realize, all of you, I'm very, very pleasantly surprised. Only one fifth of you. Are looking at your mobile phones as I'm talking. I'm truly impressed. You are very, very good. I'm, I'm. You deserve a big applause. If I ask each one of you, spend 24 hours without your mobile phone, and you say, "What will I do?" I said, "Read a book, listen to music, go for a walk, go for a swim, climb a mountain." Most of you say, 
oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Most of you, your generation and my generation, we have become addicted. We have become slaves to that gadget. We have, we have become, it is like an alcoholic. When you don't give him his whiskey every evening, his hands are shaking. So many of you are suffering from the same disease called addiction to mobile. It's the reality of what I'm telling you. I am addicted, I know. After Pegasus was inserted into my phone and compromised, I keep my phone far away. But they can hear me, they can hear you. And they're going to put me on YouTube. So everything I say is going to be immortalized on YouTube. Look at what's happening within India. India is the only country in the world with 100,000 newspapers. Over 1,000 privately owned radio stations, community radio stations, FM radio stations. We are the only country in the world with something like 900 television channels which have given been permission by the Information and Broadcasting Ministry to uplink and broadlink, uh, uplink and downlink. And the internet, that's another story. Let's go to newspapers. India has two of the most widely circulated newspapers, daily newspapers in the world, and they're both in Hindi. But you have to understand, this is the reality. 40% of India speaks Hindi. North India, that's the language. People are reading newspapers, but more and more people are reading on screens, on their laptops, on their desktops, and on their mobile phones. This is the change in the pattern of readership. It's not that they are reading less. The second point is radio. We are the only country in the world, the only major country in the world, and that to a country that describes itself as the world's largest democracy, where news and current affairs on radio is still a monopoly of the government. The group of girls there are very busy discussing something very important, whether their boyfriend will come tomorrow or not. It's all right. I mean, it's far more important for them than to listen to an old man like me going on and on and on. They don't realize I can see them. They think I can't see them. I can see all of you. It's all right. You're forgiven. This is the reality of it. Television. Why is it that such a large proportion of the television channels in India are not playing the role that the media is supposed to play in a democracy? And what is that? You have to question those who are in positions of power and authority. You have to hold that mirror up to those who are in power. There are all kinds of journalists, you know. Just as there are all kinds of dogs. Good dogs, bad dogs. Good journalists, bad journalists. Journalists are supposed to be watchdogs. So if there is a thief or a burglar that comes into your house at 3 o'clock in the morning, the dog starts barking. The bur burglar does not know that the, the, the dog cannot bite, it can only bark. But that's all right, it's done its job. But there are many dogs who are called lap dogs. Lap in Hindi is godi. As Ravish Kumar said, it's the godi meat. The dog wags its tail, you stroke it gently, it's very happy. It doesn't bark, leave alone bite. You also have uh, you also have guide dogs, you know, Saint Bernards who saved men caught in a snow blizzard, dogs that help a visually challenged person cross a road, dogs that can sniff out explosives and narcotic substances or drugs from a pile of luggage. So there are dogs and there are dogs. But why is today such a large proportion of the media? become lap dogs, not watchdogs. Why have they stopped asking questions? Are you aware that Mr. Narendra Modi is the first and so far only Prime Minister of India who has never, never, underline never, faced an impromptu public press conference? Every Prime Minister has, more than once, but Mr. Modi hasn't. He has picked and chosen people who he interview, who interviews him. And they ask him the questions he wants us. We call them goody, goody, goody questions. They don't ask him follow-up questions. They don't ask him questions which are pointed. Sometimes Mr. Modi gives interviews to people who are not journalists, including his chief publicist, 
Prasun Joshi who asked him, Mr. Bhuti, how do you, why do you work so hard or how do you work so hard? And of course, there's a famous actor, he used to be a citizen of Canada, a very rich man, one of the top income tax payers, the Akshay Kumar. He, when he got to interview Mr. Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of the world's largest democracy, he asked him an important question, which he said his driver wanted him to ask. He said, Modi ji, aap aam kaise khata hai? How do you eat mangoes? Do, do you cut it from the top? Do you peel it or do you suck on it? If this is the atmosphere which is currently prevailing across the world of the media, why are you surprised that there is only a small proportion of the, 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 the media that is holding truths to power, that is asking questions of those who are in positions of power and authority? Take news click. We all know that Prabir Purakastha is a member of the Communist Party of India, Marxist. I'm not a member of the CPIM. But he was one man who stood by me after circumstances were created where I had to resign in July of 2017 as the editor of the Economic and Political Weeklies. You read about it if you wish to. But what is the impact? As we talk today, from the 3rd of October, more than 300 personal electronic devices, mobile phones, laptops, hard disks, pen drives, are with the Delhi police, the special cell of the Delhi police. What does this mean? One, it is sending a chilling effect across the media. See what we have done? We can do this to you. It is depriving journalists of their livelihood. You are snatching away a journalist's livelihood. <laughs> you are making it difficult for people to earn a living. I can discuss the allegations against NewsClick. That will take me half an hour. I'm not going to go into it. <laughs> if any of you are interested, I can talk about it in private. But it's all there in the public domain. I've written about it and you guys are welcome to go through what I've written. You go to my website, ranjoy.in, you'll get it. But what is the message? Never before in the history of India, in a coordinated manner, have hundreds, more than 300, perhaps 400 police personnel, men and women, in a coordinated manner, they went to the homes of 80 individuals, including journalists, including people who were associated with Prabir Prakashtha in the past, past, went to their homes at 6.30 a.m. in the morning. During the emergency, we used to hear the story about a midnight knock. This is the morning alarm service. Never before. They spread out all over the national capital region. There were some who were in Mumbai, somebody in Hyderabad, even in Kerala. Never before has this kind of an operation been conducted. Yes, the UAPA has been used against journalists, but this is the first time it's being taken in this manner. The few journalists, the few media organizations that are still independent, their life has been made difficult, including mine. Look what happened to Ravish Kumar. Soon after the Ambani's, gave up their holding in NDTV. Ravish Kumar is the person who's coined that phrase, Godi Media. He's also coined the phrase called WhatsApp University. You people are privileged. You're not getting educated in WhatsApp University. There are hundreds and hundreds of millions of young people today who are being taught, quote unquote, on WhatsApp University. This is a unique situation. You've never seen it. Over 500 million, perhaps 600 million people in India are using WhatsApp. Today, out of 140 crore, 1.4 billion, if you go to the website of the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, you will find that 1.1, 1.2 billion, 115 crore, 120 crore SIMs have been issued. What is a SIM? Subscriber Identity Module. It's a little chip inside your mobile phone. In other words, in many parts of India, or in most parts of India, there are more SIMs than human beings. Yes, there are some people with two SIMs, there are SIMs that have not been activated. But this is the reality of the new India that we are living in. I was mentioning this documentary called The Social, what is it called? Yeah, The Social Dilemma, correct. They make a very in interesting point. There are only two categories of people who sell, who describe their consumers as users. One is the social media. And the others are the drug dealers and the bootleggers and the alcohol. You're not a consumer. 
you're having ganja and charas and cocaine, alcohol, you're a user. Consumers have become user. We have become their slaves. What is the way forward? The way forward is that you have to be aware. Not only do you have to be aware, you have to make others aware. You are privileged that you have had the opportunity to be educated in an institution like this one. You are privileged that you're not growing up in WhatsApp University. I'll give you the kind of disinformation and misinformation and falsehoods and hateful speech that is propagated on WhatsApp. Not today. Eight years ago, a relative of mine came up to me and he said, calls me his uncle. You know, not every Muslim is a terrorist, but every terrorist is a Muslim. I said, really? I said, where did you read this? WhatsApp. WhatsApp has become the source for disseminating falsehoods, hateful speeches. People have been killed behind every single case of mob lynching across the country in the recent past is a WhatsApp message. These are social media platforms which have become weapons, propaganda weapons. It's very easy to be despondent. No, don't. Yes, the Congress lost Chhattisgarh. The Congress lost Madhya Pradesh. The Congress got lost Rajasthan. But in Telangana, they came back. We have a curious situation. We're south of the Vindhyas. The Bharti Janta Party doesn't exist. It is a separate matter that Jagan Reddy may go along with Modi. He may be a little worried. He doesn't want to go back to jail. He's already spent one, one year or so there on the mining scandal. I don't know, mining scandal. So is the war over? Is it inevitable that Mr. Narendra Modi is going to win a third term? I don't know. I'm not an astrologer. I'm not a Jyotishi. I don't predict the future. But look at facts. Where will the BJP gain? I think one state where the Bharti Janta Party is likely to gain is Uttar Pradesh. It is the only state in India. Uh, it's the biggest state in India. One out of six Indians live in Uttar Pradesh. If Uttar Pradesh was an independent country, it would have been the sixth most populous country on the planet. After China, India, Indonesia, Brazil, the United States, Pakistan. No, it has more people than Pakistan. There the BJP has 62 out of 8. The whole situation is very, very uncertain in states like Bihar, in states like Maharashtra. Because the equations have changed. The old National Democratic Alliance doesn't exist. The Janta Dal United, led by Nitish Kumar, is broken away. The Shiromani Akali Dal in Punjab is undecided. The Shiv Sena is in split. The Nationalist Congress Party has been split. So it's difficult to predict. The Bharatiya Janta Party swept. The NDA alliance swept these states. Let's see what happens. It is difficult times, challenging times, and especially for students like you, for educated and aware people. The fight is not over. The struggle is not over. Sometimes it appears very, very, you, you get very depressed, very, very sad. You have stopped fighting. No, don't. The darkest hour is just before the dawn. Namaskar, thank you for listening to me. Ask me to answer your questions should you wish to ask me any questions.